Welcome to the biggest dinner ever for one of the most remarkable people that we know in our field, Professor Roland R. Griffiths. I'm going to read a version of Roland's bio, partly to make sure that we're on the same page, and also so that the following speakers will not have to say these same things. That will leave them free to say other things. Dr. Roland Griffiths has been on the Johns Hopkins faculty for over 50 years, during which his primary research focus has been on the behavioral and subjective effects of mood-altering drugs. A leader in his field internationally, he has authored more than 425 scientific articles, has trained more than 60 postdoctoral fellows, and has made significant contributions to the scientific understanding of a wide range of psychoactive drugs, with particular focus on sedative hypnotics, caffeine, and psychedelics. He has been a consultant to national and international research and regulatory agencies, has been continually funded by grants from the National Institutes of Health, and has received numerous awards from prominent scientific societies. Early in his career, Dr. Griffiths conducted parallel lines of research, both preclinical and clinical, which demonstrated cross-species generality of the reinforcing, discriminative, and physical dependence producing effects of various psychoactive drugs. This led to the development of now widely used standardized procedures in laboratory animals and humans for assessing the abuse potential of new drugs. In another line of research, Dr. Griffiths showed that caffeine's subjective and behavioral effects, reinforcement and withdrawal symptoms occur at much lower doses than had previously been appreciated. His caffeine research program prompted the American Psychiatric Association's decision to include in the DSM-5 the diagnosis of caffeine withdrawal and the research diagnosis of caffeine use disorder. In 1999, after starting a regular meditation practice, Dr. Griffiths initiated the first study in decades to evaluate the effects of a high dose of a classic psychedelic drug in healthy, psychedelic, naive participants. That research showed that when administered to carefully screened and psychologically supported individuals, psilocybin produced substantial and sustained positive changes in moods attitudes, and behavior. Published in 2006, that study along with a series of later studies conducted by Dr. Griffiths and colleagues with psilocybin and other psychedelics is widely credited for the contemporary reemergence of the scientific and cultural interest in classic psychedelic compounds. In 2019, Dr. Griffiths established the Johns Hopkins Center for the Psychedelic and Consciousness Research which is deeply engaged in developing new approaches to the treatment of a range of psychiatric conditions. At the same time, Dr. Griffiths has been keenly interested in following up on his previous studies of transformative experiences in healthy participants, which included beginning meditators, long-term meditators, and religious leaders. It is that interest that inspired Dr. Griffiths to establish, in perpetuity, the newly endowed professorship with its research focus on secular spirituality and well-being in service of human flourishing. Dr. Griffiths, yes. Dr. Griffiths gratefully acknowledges Johns Hopkins for its commitment to academic freedom and for its support of the admittedly bold endowment. Okay, before I add a few words, I'm getting the idea that some of you can hear me very well, where others of you cannot. So I'm going to request a little agreement that when speakers are speaking, please do not be talking at the tables. There will be large gaps. There will be large gaps in the program for eating and speaking to the people next to you. 
But uh, let me say again, please, if we can withhold speaking at the tables when there is a speaker on stage. Again, thank you. If we can withhold speaking at the tables when there is a speaker up here, it'll make it much easier for everyone. Better, better, much better. Okay, the few words I want to add are about uh, the first psilocybin paper from Johns Hopkins, titled Psilocybin Can Occasion Mystical Type Experience Having Substantial and Sustained Personal Meaning and Spiritual Significance. You know, when the plans for that project began, it may be difficult to imagine now, but if you were a scientist in the field or any professional in any professional job, you basically did not talk about psychedelics at all, except to close personal friends that you thought would be receptive. There are people in the field who work with psychedelics or use them for various purposes who believed that their phones would be tapped or could be tapped. And if you were to say to your department chair, I'd like to do human research with the psychedelic, you would be met with very unusual looks, and this would not be a great way to advance your career. Um, well, once again, please, if we could withhold conversation at the tables until the breaks in the program. Maybe that's just not going to work. So I want to credit Roland and his colleagues for the small conversations that began between Roland and a colleague on the IRB saying, I believe this is a tractable scientific problem. We can use rigorous scientific method to examine the effects of psilocybin in healthy volunteers. And it's likely to be interesting and fruitful. So this went to the Institutional Review Board and to their credit, they had some questions, reasonable ones for Roland, which were answered, and they eventually said, okay. But then something unusual happened. We were waiting for a reply. Can we start now? FDA has said yes. The IRB has said yes. The answer is no, actually, we're waiting for another yes. Turns out this protocol had been referred to the dean of the medical school, who is not usually in the practice of reviewing human research protocols. Long pause, biting your fingernails. Finally, there was a green light. May we start yet? No, not yet. So Hopkins is a big institution. I believe there's four campuses in Baltimore, one in Washington, one in between, one in Florence, one in Beijing, maybe others I don't know about. Over that whole enterprise, there's a single president and a single managing attorney. Our protocol got bounced to the managing attorney of the whole global Hopkins enterprise. Why would that be? Biting the fingernails. Finally, the word came back, okay. So the narrative I have about that after the fact is that the university was informing people, like, you might want to know this is coming down the pike. But at the end of the day, the university kept to its commitment of academic freedom. And now I just promise you that Johns Hopkins is so pleased and so honored that Roland has carried out this line of research that when the professorship was instituted a week ago Wednesday. The reception for Roland and David Yadin and colleagues was held in the president's house. Unprecedented. Okay, at this time, I would like to invite some of Roland's longtime colleagues to come up to the stage. You're welcome to come up all at once, but then please Speak one at a time, and after you've spoken, leave on this side of the stage. Um, I'll say your names now, but when you come up here, would you please um, identify your relationship with Roland, and then take two to three minutes to share your words about him. So David Nutt, Harriet DeWitt, and Mary Casamano, who will speak first for herself and then for Bill Richards. Hi, um, you've probably worked out by now that I'm David Nutt. 
since I'm the only male of the three up here. Um, it's fantastic to be here. Uh, this is really an example of the last shall be first because uh, less than two hours ago I was bouncing away in the clouds over Denver trying to land but I've made it and uh, I'm so delighted to be So I, um, I may not be Roland's oldest friend, or even Roland's longest friend. Um, I might be both those things, but one thing I'm absolutely certain of is that I'm Roland's longest British friend. And uh, we've been friends for so long that uh, we go back to before they even invented the term psychedelic. We go back to the days when pharmacology was very traditional and straightforward, and you had neurotransmitters like GABA, you had drugs like benzodiazepines and caffeine changing the brain in predictable ways. Uh, and uh, my first memory of Roland is in Kyoto in the 1980s. Now, you've probably all seen the film Lost in Translation. Well, if you haven't, you should, because that's what it's like when you're really jet-lagged at a conference in Japan. And I remember many conversations with Roland sitting around the carp pool outside of the conference venue and uh, talking about science, but also talking about other aspects of life. And that's when I got to know him as a human being as well as a fantastic scientist. Subsequently, he inv invited me to look around his laboratories in Francis Scott Key up in uh, Baltimore. And at that point, I realized I couldn't compete with the enormous uh, ability that he and his team had to do human psychopharmacology. So I moved into brain imaging, which uh, needed smaller numbers and was slightly easier to do. And our paths rather diverged then. But I also took up a post uh, as uh, editor of the Journal of Psychopharmacology. And in 2006, a very interesting little paper came my way. Now, I don't know, Roland, whether we were the first choice of that paper. I suspect we weren't. But it did find a very good home there. <laughs> And of course, that was the, the very famous landmark paper of psilocybin um, producing long-lasting changes in well-being and altered perceptions of one's role in life. And that paper got me <clears throat> very interested in the question of what is going on in the brain to explain. There's remarkable psychological uh, outputs from uh, Roland's first paper on psychedelics. And uh, I'm honored to say we've been able to carry on publishing your work at, um, over the last uh, decade or more. Um, and of course, you've spurred me on into doing uh, quite a lot in that field too. So I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for a lot, an enduring friendship, uh, a lot of wisdom, and for a lot of encouragement. Thank you very much. Good evening. I had a couple of slides. I don't know if there's anyone managing slides in the back, but if you have them, good. If not, fine. Uh, on this occasion of recognizing Roland Griffith's contributions to the field, I'd like to go back in time to before he was a rock star in the world of psychedelics. When I first met Roland 40 years ago, he was a rigorous behavioral pharmacologist who followed the tenets of B.F. Skinner. Like many re drug researchers at that time, 
he focused on objective behavioral outcome measures and carefully avoided thinking of drugs or behavior in terms of mind, thoughts, feelings, or consciousness. We've come a long way. Beginning with some personal insights and his landmark paper of 2006, Roland led the field of research into the mysteries of consciousness and the altered states induced by this extraordinary class of drugs. He's released a tsunami of research and scholarly thought on this topic, ranging from neuroscience to religion. Uh, the first slide here summarizes by the numbers some of uh, Roland's accomplishments. Uh, just, I won't go through them, five decades of research, uh, close to 40,000 uh, citations, and a whole series of drugs that he's looked at. The second slide draws attention, could I have the next slide? The second slide draws attention to his highly productive career before psychedelics entered his psyche. Before 2006, Dr. Griffiths was already a world authority on human behavior related to smoking and alcohol use, and then more strongly with abuse potential of sedative drugs and then caffeine. He averaged during that time about 500 citations for, per year for his work. Citations are the currency of some of us as researchers. The third slide shows the impact of Dr. Griffith's works has had since that 2006 paper, purely by the numbers again. In a truly courageous career move, he had the vision to step into a previously taboo field of psychedelic research. Psychedelic drugs and internal states they induced were largely considered to be beyond the domain of scientific study, especially for a behaviorist. Bolstered by his career, curiosity and his impeccable personal and scientific credentials, Roland stepped into this domain, one that has brought uh, over 11,000 people to this meeting today. I'm delighted to celebrate Roland's vision and determination and his exceptional personal drive to bring psychedelic research back into the mainstream of science. Bravo, Roland. Um, hello, my name is Mary Customano. Uh, And, well, I'm actually going to start with Bill Richards because he wasn't able to make it tonight. So, Roland, I'm going to read you what he wrote to say to you um, and with very much, you know, regret. So he said, Dear Roland, in tribute to our long relationship during the rebirth and expansion of the research with the sacred molecules we call psychedelic, I honor you in being in its many facets. I fondly remember our first encounter, orchestrated by Bob Jesse over dinner in the home of Dan Perrine, our unfolding dreams during the dawn of the 21st century, as one of the study after study was designed, successfully implemented and published, and the vistas now revealing themselves as research at Hopkins and many sites throughout the world expands beyond our wildest hopes and dreams. Thank you for your patience and steady attention to details, notably when dealing with colleagues at Hopkins who initially were unable to comprehend the potential import of our interests with the IRBs, the DEAs, and the FDA. Though I am unable to be physically present with you this evening, I will always be with you in spirit. Onward in life, Bill. So. I wish I could see you better, Roland. <laughs> um, so I started with Roland and Bill in 2000 when we started. And in thinking about what I would say, immediately what came to mind was I'm doing this because the lights are in my eyes and I want to see Roland. Um, because the, the, the immediate thing was the reason that I am here and have had all the experience that I have had was because of Roland. 
and his ability to get this started. And I will, I can't even put into words the gratitude for that. And then I was, and we were only supposed to talk two minutes. So what do I say in the two minutes? And so I just closed my eyes and what do I want to say? Because there's so many ways and things I could say. And, and it was just focusing on Roland. And, and so, so this, is, this is the thing that Roland and I had like so amazing a relationship. So for the first 20 years, he and I saw, knew, met with almost every single one of our volunteers every time they came in. And before their sessions, whether I was a guide or not, afterwards, um, during their and times they came in, and then we got to get together and talk about them. Because there's nothing more joyful than to be able to share what we see and what we, what, our, what we were doing, and to see time after time these transformations and this help and, and this gratitude that, you know, these people's lives were changed. And so, I mean, we, and, and so over the years, so many people continue to reach out to us, you know, from our studies 20 some years ago. But, you know, since Roland has been sick, and, um, or whatever you want to say, but um, so many, so many, so many people reach out and say, please tell Roland, please tell Roland, please tell how, how grateful I am, how my life has been changed, how, what you did. And so I tell you, but I just want to let everyone, in. and there's many here from our studies. And um, so thank you, Roland. We will always have what we wanted to do, all those memories of all those volunteers that we have been with. So thank you all. David, Harriet, and Mary, thank you very much. And thank you, Bill and Absentia. The next group of speakers giving tribute to Roland will be center and organization leaders. Would the following people please come up to the stage? Fred Barrett, Rick Doblin, Michael Bogenschutz, Steve Ross, and Rachel Yehuda. You know, it's really remarkable thinking about how many people are here this weekend. I keep telling people the cat's out of the bag, the genie's out of the bottle, the, uh, the train's left the station. Um, I'm standing in front of you today, uh, as of yesterday, as the director of the Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research at Johns Hopkins University. And I end every talk that I can with a, a, a kind of throw up of all of the faces of the people who work in the center. And I say, these are the folks with whom I have the privilege of working with and without whom none of this would happen. But the reality is none of this would be happening in the way that it's happening without Roland Griffiths. And, with, with all honesty, Rick Doblin, of course, but we're here to talk about Roland. <laughs> um, I, I can't express how humbling and, and, and how much of an honor it is to lead the center that Roland built and how important it is for me to be a good steward of the scientific program and really the, the promise for the future that Roland has bequeathed to us in the work that he's done. So I'd like to end on a, a bit of a kind of change of scene. I'm grateful for you all to come to this experiment. I'm the PI of the experiment that's gonna last for at least another 37 seconds. Um, in preparing you for the journey that we're all about to embark, embark upon, I wanna leave you with uh, three 
three pieces of uh, wisdom that you're going to bring with you. Trust, let go, and be open. The, the way that Roland has imparted these to me uh, over the past 10 years is to trust that if you follow the data, if you follow the science, if you follow the truth, then the truth will out and you will be able to truly do, do something remarkable. Uh, he's, he's taught me to let go when you know, we've been three or four hours reading over a manuscript line by line, word for word. I have to trust and let go of, of the, uh, you know, the need to, uh, to, to really be anything less than the most precise and clear and trust, let go, and be open. Being open to the possibilities that lay in front of us, Roland likes to say, we should treat the lab as carnival. We have to be open to that. We have to be open to the joy of discovery and the possibility that if we do this right, then we may help millions of people. And that's what you've left us, Roland. And that's what we're grateful for. So I thank you for that. Um, what I'd like to share tonight, first off, Roland, I'm so grateful that you could be here with us in person, with, with your wife together. And when we think about the implications of the research, of all the different kind of psychedelic research studies that are being done, the work that with MDMA for PTSD, psilocybin for cancer patients with anxiety, the work with substance abuse, all of these different studies, what I'd really just like to leave you with is the most important study with the most important implications that is being conducted right now with psychedelics is being conducted by Roland and Tony Bosis, and it's the Religious Leaders Study. And that study has the biggest implications because what the examination is, what the potential is, is to discover are there a common mystical core for, from which all the religions spring. And the implications of that, and I, I don't know what you're going to find, and I don't know how your results actually are, but I do know that that exploration of how do we move from understanding religions uh, like languages, that there's different languages, no language is better than the other, they're all different cultural evolutions about it, but I think the thing that really makes me ad admire the work that Roland is doing right now is that I really think the courage to take on that question and the courage then to report on whatever the results you actually got, that I think that is the study that has the broadest political and social and spiritual implications of anything that any of us are doing. So thank you very much for that, Roland. So I'm very grateful to be here and have this opportunity to say a few words in appreciation of Roland. So we all know that Roland is a peerless scientist and one of the great pioneers in the field of psychedelic research. But I'd like to tell you some of the things about Roland that I value even more. I admire Roland's intellectual and personal honesty. Roland is the most meticulous scientist I know, and I can't imagine him ever knowingly saying anything that was untrue. I also admire Roland's courage, the courage to embark on a course of research that was baffling and strongly discouraged by many of his peers, the courage to persist in this course, and the courage to embrace and learn from all of life's challenges. But the first word that comes to mind when I think of Roland is curiosity. When you talk to Roland about psychedelics or about consciousness, you can see how deeply and intensely he engages his entire self in exploring these mysteries. What's remarkable to me is that he enjoys the mystery itself and not just the prospect of getting an answer or the answer itself. This attitude of curiosity is the right way to do science, and it's the right way to do life. On a personal note, Roland's 2006 paper 
was what convinced me to try to do clinical trials with psilocybin and to treat alcohol use disorder, a decision that transformed my career and ultimately many other aspects of my life in ways I could scarcely have imagined at the time. So Roland, I'm really happy to have this opportunity to thank you publicly for all that you've done for the field and for me as a role model, as a colleague, and as a friend. Thanks. Hey, buddy. Um, Roland. Uh, I first met Roland in 2006. It was a Hefter meeting. And um, yeah, I thought this is an interesting guy. Um, Roland was gracious enough to invite our group at NYU down to Hopkins to meet with his team. And um, it was a transformative moment for me. And it started this next 10 years where we did these projects together using psilocybin plus psychotherapy to treat people that had advanced cancer. And um, I was happy to be competing against Roland and Hopkins. It was a, a fierce competition for a long time. But, but more than that, I, I realized that we were doing something important um, and, and I greatly benefited from the collaboration over time. When we went to write up the paper for the study, I had spent all this time writing it up. Roland shared a, a copy of his paper, and I realized this is a true master, um, and, and was able to, to sort of uh, change the paper to make it look like, like Roland's. But more than the collaboration over time, it's, it's been the friendship that's been most important to me, Roland. I, was, I went through a difficult divorce about a decade ago, and you stepped in and have done so over time to help me with that, especially dealing with problems with my kids. And, and for that, I'm deeply grateful. Um, and finally, what I want to say is, is um, your illness has, has been an inspiration to me in terms of the way you've dealt with it. Um, I'm, I'm scared to die. I'm definitely not ready. I'm a hypochondriac. And you diving into this thing with um, such grace and uh, sense of excitement um, and telling me to, to live my life fully now has, um, has been remarkable for me. So I wanted to thank you for that and just tell you how much I love you. Hello and good evening. There's no real appreciation of light without darkness, they say. And today, as you all know, is the solstice. And so there's more light today than there will be on any other day this year. So I think it's really fitting that we're celebrating Roland today. Roland, when we met, it was quite literally and figuratively the equinox, we met in December. And it was a dark time, both in reality and for the field of psychedelics. But there's something really interesting about the equinox. When my kids were little, my husband and I used to take raw eggs out of the refrigerator. And if you place them on the counter, what happens is on the equinox only, the egg balances and it stands upright. So Roland, when I met you, you were that egg on the equinox. You had done something that really required just a very specific gravitational pull, an academic center about psychedelics. And I found it so inspiring. So you're my spiritual oracle, Roland, and the conversation we had before has so deeply inspired me and thank you for your faith um, and your encouragement and support. I went home and our team formed because you did it and we need to do it and lots of other places need to do it too. And that's what I call true light and inspiration. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is your cruise ship director speaking. Uh, we know that pretty much everyone here traveled from very far away to be at this conference and chose to be at this dinner to honor Roland. 
and had many, 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 many options of what to do with this week of your life and even what to do with this evening as it, it seems that our cup kind of runneth over with social options this whole week. And we know that right now we're, we're kind of dining in a tin can with thousands of people um, and listening to sort of it's like that game where you get the tin cans and you can link them with a string so that you could talk to the person next door as a kid, even though it, it kind of doesn't sound great. But the reason we're here is important. We hope all of you did find somewhere to sit uh, with new friends and old. And we just want to thank everyone here for your patience and your grace and your kindness and your forgiveness and really appreciate everyone who did make the trip out here to Denver, everyone who did choose to spend this evening with Roland and his friends and colleagues and all of your new and old friends and colleagues. So thank you again for taking the journey with us. It's not always easy, but it's often worth it. And with that, I would love to welcome back to the stage uh, our master of ceremonies for the evening, Bob Jesse. The cosmic applause that we had was so cool. It's great that it's calmed down a little bit. So uh, if you were to see the program the rest of us have, you would see that this time is simply labeled interlude. Very mysterious, huh? So this interlude is an opportunity for all of you to see, for the first time ever, a very special tribute to Roland Griffiths. give you a clue. Here to present it are Alex and Allison Gray, accompanied by Miriam Vallott and Cody Swift. Please welcome them. So my name is Cody Swift, and this is Miriam Vallott, and we're from the River Sticks Foundation. Thank you. And I've known Roland for over 15 years now, and he was literally the first person I spoke to when I came into the psychedelic field, talking about the cancer anxiety study. And since he's become such a dear friend, a mentor, a collaborator, and like a father figure to me. And when I think about Roland, I think about his endless curiosity. And like the true archetype of a scientist following truth in this endless forms. And that curiosity is not only about empirical data, but I would say it's also about the story. And Roland and I have a little bit of a loving tension going on between us at times around the quantitative and the qualitative aspects of this research ongoing and um, and just echoing what Mary said one of the most striking things when I worked at Roland's lab was seeing how after every session every participant session he would create time and space for them to come into his office and he would hear their stories with just full open-hearted curiosity and he is a busy man and to create that time says a lot about the genuine curiosity and his love for this work and when I think about Roland, and I also think about Rick Doblin, these two individuals, I think more than anyone, anyone else that I could imagine, have contributed to the healing of so many people in the world. And as this movement unfolds, we'll continue to heal. And so when Roland received his diagnosis, and I, and I heard about his diagnosis, I mean, I, there was a whole flurry of emotions that came around it, but I just felt compelled that I had to do something to honor him. And, and I sat with it with tears and, uh, and wading through all these emotions, and the first thought that came to my, set, my head was, 
he needs to be honored and remembered in support of the preeminent psychedelic artist, Alex Gray and Alison Gray. <laughs> And so, in a way, this is a gift from River Sticks, and in part, it's a gift to Roland, but even more, it's a gift to this community. Because the real intention behind this gift was actually to ensure that for generations to come, that Roland would be remembered for the gift that he gave all of us and the gift he gave humanity. And so, with that, um, we will unveil. Thank you so much, Cody, for the opportunity to honor a man that has been so important in terms of scrupulous science providing the evidence for the medical benefits of psilocybin and to draw the mystical experience and psychedelic healing into uh, focus and in that way bring science and spirituality that much closer. I feel so honored to have this opportunity and it's, it's been a, a real journey. Uh, I don't know whether Bob Jesse realizes he wound up in this painting as well, but he'll find out. And uh, Bill Griffiths, your old friend, and Maria Sabina, I feel, is hovering over. And Mary Casamano there is also in session and um, also in the uh, kind of neural galactic web that's woven behind there. Um, they're all his uh, thought forms of love that you're sending out, which are infinite. And I think of this as Roland's sacred gift because he isn't grasping it. He's uh, allowing it to levitate into the uh, higher realms that uh, are the destiny of psychedelic science and I think psychedelic culture. So thank you for leading the way and inspiring this small homage uh, to, your, to your work. Well, Alex is saying that I should tell you that this piece has been allowed to be long-term loaned to the Psychedelic Reliquary at COSM. So that when you come to visit us, It'll be among the other psychedelic heroes that Alex has done uh, beautiful and amazing portraits of. And you know some of them, like Dr. Hoffman and Dr. Shulgin and uh, Ann Shulgin and, and, uh, and Dr. Groff and Ram Das, And many, many other you know, pe people have been portrayed in the uh, new Eleusis painting. All the history of psychedelics is in that painting. But I just wanted to say that not only do I want to, you know, glow in, in, in total awe and gratitude for the heart of my life, Alex Gray. Um, but I also want to honor Dr. Griffiths for, and honor him specifically for me for starting this incredible psychedelic center in my hometown of Baltimore, Maryland. You know, even, even the right neighborhood. It's just so beautiful there, and, and, and the people there are so lucky to have it. And I just wanted to thank Rick Doblin, a friend from a really long time that I've, we've admired so greatly, and everyone here for keeping the spirit of psychedelics in your heart, and Alex and I in your heart too. 
So thank you so much. I'm blown away. What a wonderful tribute, what a wonderful gift. Still just taking it in. Um, Alex and Allison, thank you so much. Cody and Miriam, thank you for making this happen. Cody, for your kind words. We have one last group of people to bring forth before some closing remarks. And these are people who have been mentored by Roland either a long while ago or a short while ago, <clears throat> and young researchers in the field. I'd like to invite these people to come to stage now. Natalie Gukasian, Sandeep Nayak, Kit Bonson, Teresa Carbonaro, and David Yaden. Please feel free to start by sharing a few words about your relationship with Roland. And um, I'll be back when you're done. Hey, everybody. Hear me okay? Ooh, this is much louder than before. Um, so my name is Natalie Gukasian. I'm a psychiatrist. Um, I've been with, the, with Hopkins for about eight years and with the center for about five. Um, and the research that Roland and his illustrious colleagues have been doing was one of the main reasons I wanted to come to Hopkins why I ranked it in my residency ranking list. Um, and it really excited me, you know, and I tried to get my foot in the door for a long time. Uh, at Hopkins, it took a couple tries. Uh, at the time, actually, you know, people in our own department were not especially encouraging of this research, said it was a career killer, uh, was something that we should avoid. Um, but I am stubborn. And I was like, whatever, man. And so I just kept knocking on that door and eventually it worked out. Um, and I'm extremely grateful for all the opportunities that have been uh, laid out in large part by Roland um, and all of the other folks that he's mentored along the way. Um, and I remember my first sit down conversation with Roland. Uh, the first thing he said to me was, Natalie, we don't discuss personal drug use when we're uh, in these sorts of settings and anything you say is plausibly deniable in this sort of setting. I was like, you didn't need to tell me that, but thank you. Um, and in that conversation, we, you know, had a, we talked about some really exciting ideas and um, outlined, you know, a vision of what a postdoctoral fellowship could look like for me. Um, and the last thing he said to me uh, was, "Welcome home." <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I, I really can't imagine a, a place that I'd rather be, or rather have been for the last four years. Um, as, a, as a mentor, Roland was outstanding. He helped me grow, he challenged me. Um, he was extremely patient, uh, very generous with his time. Uh, he supported me in a difficult decision about next steps in my career. Um, and even now, as I'm in the process of transitioning to a new position outside of Hopkins, he's generously offered to continue meeting me with, with me like once a week. And I'm like, even, even with everything that's going on. So um, I think that's just an illustration of really how um, generous he is. And I also know that that probably wouldn't be possible without Marla and the support that he, <laughs> that Marla's offered to Roland uh, throughout all the time that I've known him. Yeah. So behind every great man, usually there's a pretty outstanding woman. And so thank you, Marla. Um, so Roland, thank you for everything you've done to open up the psychedelic science field. Um, for myself, for other young researchers in this field, work that's so important um, and work that was out of reach for so long um, and work that will hopefully continue to change the world. So thank you. Hello, everyone. 
Uh, my name is Sandeep Nayak, and it has been my great, great pleasure to work with Roland at Hopkins the last three and a half years, both personal and professional. So I remember when Roland called me with the news of his cancer, I missed the call, called back, and I said, I'm so sorry to hear this terrible news. And Roland said, it's not terrible news. I'm sort of paraphrasing, but he said, it's interesting news, it's momentous news. At, at the time, I thought, maybe denial, but no, no, it was actually the opposite. It's this consistent, curious engagement with life. Roland will often end our regular work meetings by asking, so, you having fun? He just exudes this joy for science that is so contagious uh, and genuine. He's a very tenacious man. Uh, this is so whether he's critiquing my figures or rejuvenating a decades more of on field, thereby launching clinical trials, careers. But Roland does this because he's fascinated. He finds it important and he's having fun. In everything Roland does, there is this thread of curiosity, open spiritedness, an openness to challenge. He's a man who's both searching for, but has also found something. Just watching him, I've learned so much uh, in life and in science. I mean, they're kind of inseparable. Um, so how incredible that his fascination turned out to be of such great value to others. Roland, look, look at the world you have built. As a, as a mentee, as a friend, as a grateful citizen of this world, thank you so much for who you are and what you've done. I will always be grateful. Hi, can you hear me? I'm Kit Bonson. So I'm a pharmacologist and I met Roland in 1995 when I came for an interview for a postdoc position in the Behavioral Pharmacology Research Unit at Hopkins. And I had been working on, at the National Institute of Mental Health doing rodent studies on LSD. And I just completed the first survey study of using the internet to investigate how antidepressants could increase or decrease the response that people had to psychedelics the results of which still influence all clinical studies today. And Roland had already developed an interest in psychedelics based on his meditation practice, so he was very interested in recruiting me to BPRU because most scientists at the time would not admit that they had an interest in psychedelics. Instead, scientists would say, I'm fascinated with serotonin, which usually was code for, I really wish it was still legit to study hallucinogens. After having me recount my scientific work at NIMH, he had one final question for me. And being that Roland is innately curious and wants to know everything, he leaned forward and said, so have you ever taken these drugs yourself? And I recoil a little bit, because you know, I'm working for the federal government at NIMH. So I laugh a little and say, uh, Dr. Griffiths, I don't know that it's a good idea to ask a candidate during a job interview if they've engaged in illegal drug use. To which, of course, he agreed. But then I leaned forward and I said, but that doesn't mean that you can't tell me about yourself. <laughs> and he smiled and he demurred and said that perhaps I had been right about the appropriateness of the topic. So I ended up accepting a position at BPRU, and Roland and I started mocking out protocols for clinical studies with psychedelics and thinking through which scientific questions were the most important. And it was about this time that the chair of the Department of Psychiatry at Hopkins, which BPRU is part of, got wind of what we were wanting to do and requested that I come up to the other Hopkins campus to meet him. And I asked his secretary why he wanted the appointment, and she said, Oh, you know, he just wants to make sure you're not a hippie. He hates hippies. So I put on my best professional dress, and after passing the chairman's test, Roland and I started to think about a drug source for our study. Somebody mentioned to me that I ought to call Saul Snyder, 
since he had a long-standing interest in psychedelics going back to the 1960s and might have some ideas. Now, this is the famous Dr. Solomon Snyder, the professor at Hopkins who demonstrated for the first time in 1973 that receptors existed, along with two people in another lab and his postdoc, Candace Pert, who many of you probably know from her interest in alternative medicine. So I call up Dr. Snyder and he was so thrilled that Roland and I wanted to reinvigorate psychedelic investigations that he promised me that if we ever got a clinical study approved to go forward that he would give us his psilocybin tablets with matching placebos, which to a scientist is like somebody offering you warm chocolate chip cookies. But after all this groundwork, we still had one major problem. Roland still hadn't yet met Bob Jesse, so we didn't have any money for this glorious return of psychedelic research on humans. And by the time that he and Bob had gotten together, I had already moved on to another institution. In the psychedelic research field, it's important to address the longevity of the effects of psychedelics. Well, in conclusion, I would like to address how Roland's influence still resonates with me 30 years after we first conspired to do excellent research on psychedelics. He's a complex thinker, well-trained in both psychology and pharmacology, and he is responsible for me learning the deep principles of clinical investigation that put safety of the subject first and last, where you understand that the way you frame a scientific question will determine the results that you get, and the interpretations you make must stick to the data and allow for criticisms of the limits of what you produced. I love you, Roland, and I'm proud to be part of your scientific lineage. Good evening, everyone. My name is Teresa. I'm a former postdoc of Roland's. I started working with him in 2013, but left his lab in 2017. Tonight, I feel both honored and humbled to pay tribute to a man who is not only distinguished in his work, but is a beacon, beacon and embodiment of wisdom, dedication, compassion, courage, perseverance, and brilliance. Today, we celebrate the enduring legacy and remarkable achievements of a man who has illuminated a path for others, including myself. Roland, or affectionately known as Uncle Roro by a close circle, because uh, he is not only a mentor, but feels like a family member. That crazy uncle, not afraid to talk about or do anything, and I mean anything. After I left his lab, we started meeting on Saturdays for hours. Uh, and during those, we would basically talk about anything. From, we were supposed to be writing manuscripts, but it was also a time and space to have open conversations on things like meditation, spirituality, family, politics, life events, including his hot air balloon experience, um, and travel, and yes, a little bit of science, and actually those manuscripts we were drafting. Those Saturdays were the highlight of my weeks. They went on for a couple of years after I left his lab. I continue to learn from you, including how to be very particular on each written word, a, very, a, a truly a good skill. But Roland, your contributions excel, extend well beyond the confines of the lab, the pages of academic journals, or the countless pages of those drafts that we wrote, including those hands-on graphs. You have truly carved a path like no other. You have impacted the lives of countless people, including myself, which speaks volumes about your dedication and commitment. Through all of your values, you have shown me and all of us that it's not enough to simply look at the world as it is, but we must dare to envision it as it could be. To not be afraid to ask endless questions, and I mean endless questions. May your pioneering spirit continue to inspire and provide courage while also considering all of the angles. May we remain aware of our awareness. And on behalf of myself and everyone here and everyone that couldn't be here, who wishes that they could be here, sorry, uh, I would like to express my deepest gratitude and show my heartfelt admiration. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for everything that you've done for me and for my family. And to Marla, thank you for your support and willingness to share him with, with us throughout all of these years. 
and particularly those special Saturdays that we got to share. And I'm pretty sure I went over the time that we were supposed to go on those Saturdays. So thank you so much. I'm David Yaden, and as of a few days ago, I'm the Roland R. Griffiths PhD professor in psychedelic research and secular spirituality and well-being. Thank you. So anyone familiar with this endowment will know that I have millions of reasons to be grateful for Roland uh, on a professional level and I can't even begin to express my gratitude on a, a personal level for all that I've learned from Roland. So Roland has done that rare thing, that thing that all of us scientists yearn to do uh, every waking moment of our lives, which is to discover something, to, take a, to build a brick of knowledge and put it in the edifice of human knowledge as a whole. This is the great path of being a scientist. And Roland has not only done that, he's authored classic papers, he's sparked a worldwide scientific field, and I think he's the reason why many of us are here today. Uh, it's not an understatement to say that we are all witnessing history here and now. So I want to devote a few precious seconds of my two minutes uh, to ask you to, to raise your glass and find someone at the table that you're sitting at and make eye contact with them and ask them the question that Roland has asked all of us many times before, which is, are you aware that you're aware? And hold that in absolute silence. Absolute silence. I know it's a little awkward. But if you push past the awkwardness, there's something extraordinarily precious there. It's what matters most to us in all of life. And so you can take a nice deep breath, raise your glass, clink those glasses together for Roland and his contributions. <laughs> okay, so it was important that I say all that first because what I'm gonna say next may surprise you, but Roland is just a regular guy. <laughs> Roland is very human, Ro and he'll be the first to remind you of that. And if uh, uh, you try to put Roland up on a pedestal, and he will kick that pedestal out, <laughs> and he will remind you that he's just a guy. Uh, and what's tricky about that is it means that we all have it within us, to realize we're aware that we're aware, uh, and to do things like face our own mortality uh, and difficult uh, diagnoses with grace and gratitude and joy. Uh, that, that means that we have that responsibility as well. Uh, so uh, Roland will, will refuse being put on a pedestal, I think. And that's important to say because of what I'm gonna say next which is I think that Roland uh, is a new kind of archetype. He's a, a sage for our age. Now, when you think about the kind of person who would generally say something like, are you aware that you're aware, uh, and talk about the benefits of meditation, usually those kinds of people are pretty anti-science, anti-quantification, uh, anti-rigor. Uh, anyone who has written a paper with Roland and gotten a phone call at 10.30 at night on a Saturday asking to go through a table or going through a paragraph word for word 
knows that Roland uh, is not kicking back and taking it easy and unplugging from the world, quite the contrary. He is actively engaged in the minutia and the details and the hard work of making real things happen in the world. And so I think what Roland has done is uh, done away with the false dichotomy of spirituality on one hand and science on the other, uh, or uh, joy and positive emotion and presence on the one hand and analytical rigor and, and attention to data on the other. Uh, he's collapsed those dichotomies, and, and that's why I think Roland is uh, not only uh, a brilliant scientist uh, and one who will be in the history books, uh, and not only a kind of a sage for our age, uh, but he's also just a regular guy. So Roland, thank you on so many levels uh, I, I, that I can't put into words. Uh, thank you. And thank you. Thank you all for coming up and for your words. Next up is somebody named Michael Pollan. You might have heard the name before. Uh, Michael is a very well-known figure who's been a journalist for many years, very successful. And in about the, uh, the past decade, took an interest in our field. And since that time, he's come to know the field very deeply. He's come to know many of the key deeply, and principal among them, he's come to know Roland very deeply. So I'd like to welcome Michael to the stage to give us a few words about Roland. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. What an honor to be able to stand up here and say a few words about Roland. Um, You've heard from a lot of people, uh, and I want to just try to give you a slightly different perspective on Roland, uh, one that a, a journalist who's interviewed him probably a half dozen times, if not more. Um, you know, as a science writer, I've interviewed a great many scientists, but none of them is remotely like Roland Griffith. Why? I think it's because he is a man of two minds, two equally interesting minds. One, as you've heard a lot about, is the mind of a rigorous, scrupulous, well-respected scientist. So what he says carries the weight of science with a capital S. I interview lots of people like that and I harvest their quotes in my articles. But the other is the mind of a man willing to say things about consciousness about ultimate reality, about the fate of the species that will absolutely blow your mind. Honestly, for a journalist, Roland is a dream come true. I remember the first time we met in his Hopkins office in 2014. I had no idea what to expect. It certainly wasn't that this gray thatched fellow in a necktie sitting before me would tell me about the mystical experience he'd had at a meditation retreat. It had acquainted him with, and I quote, something way, way beyond a material worldview that I can't really talk to my colleagues about because it involves metaphors or assumptions that I'm really uncomfortable with as a scientist. Say what? During that same interview, he suddenly turned the tables on me asking me about my own metaphysical and spiritual beliefs. How sure are you there is nothing after death, he demanded to know. I demurred, but he persisted. What do you think the chances are there is something beyond death? And then, being a scientist, he said, in percentages. I think I mumbled two to three percent. I have no idea where that figure came from. That's a lot, he said, banging his desk. I can't think of anything more interesting than what I may or may not discover at the time I die. That's the most interesting question going. 
Western materialism says the switch gets turned off and that's it. But there's so many other descriptions. It could, it could be a beginning. Wouldn't that be amazing? I've thought a lot about that exchange in the last few months as Roland has engaged our, our whole culture in a crucial, candid, and incredibly generous conversation about death and life. In his approach to the deepest questions of consciousness, Roland reminds me of William James in his willingness to stare into the face of mystery and uncertainty rather than, as so many scientists do, reduce, dismiss, or simply ignore the phenomenon of consciousness, as the behaviorists who trained him recommended he do. He's way too curious for that. Roland shares James's radical openness and epistemological modesty, qualities that are really rare among scientists today. So what are we to make of this man of two minds? reductive scientist and metaphysical inquirer, a man who can worry about the hype bubble surrounding psychedelics today, and yet at the same time maintain we may need them to save the species from destroying itself. Confused? Self-contradictory? I don't think so. In the case of Roland Griffith, I'm more inclined to agree with F. Scott Fitzgerald, who wrote, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. This is who we have before us. A first-rate intelligence consisting in equal parts of rigorous scientist and equally rigorous spiritual explorer, able to hold not just two ideas, but two entire worldviews in one mind. I think I speak for all of us in saying that our minds have been immeasurably expanded by sharing this life with his. So thank you, Roland. Please welcome Professor Roland R. Griffiths. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So I'll have more of an opportunity to say something about this tomorrow. Uh, gratitude has always been a practice and it's the primary practice that Marla and I have uh, have been engaged with in this last year and a half since my diagnosis. It's, it's gratitude for the preciousness of life. And it does fit absolutely with the investigations that we undergo in spiritual practices, in meditation, and in some forms of psychedelic experience. Uh, the wonder of the nature of consciousness, the fact that we are aware of aware, the astonishing mystery, the fact that it doesn't in any respect appear to be scientifically tractable uh, presently. Or we don't have a coherent physics. We don't understand consciousness. Uh, but what we can lean into is this precious gift that all of us have been given, and that is that we are conscious. It's something that we alone can affirm 
to be true. We don't know it for other people. But isn't it amazing that we've been, been invited to this party <laughs> that we don't understand what the hell is going on here? So, so great gratitude and all the lovely things that have been said about me. But I've really come up to kick the props underneath the portrait <laughs> because I'm really honored and I, I have the, the greatest uh, respect and fondness uh, for all of the work that Alex and Allison have done in terms of putting in artistic form uh, some of the ineffable things that emerge with psychedelics and that I, I have to say, that, I mean it came as a surprise to me that this was done. <laughs> uh, when I first saw it, I have to tell you, uh, I felt some deep embarrassment and uh, uh, because I, I want you to know this, this is not me, you know, this is not me. I'm, uh, uh, I'm fine, I'm fine with being, being there, but let's just recognize what's going on. I mean, first of all, from this first person account, um, I, I don't deserve all this. I was simply the right person at the right time in the right place to initiate that first study. And truly speaking, I, you know, had I not been there, had I been run over by a bus, I think we would still be celebrating now or pretty close to now. I, I don't think I had all that much to do with it. I'm happy to be identified as a symbol for what's happening. But I think that's the point that I really want to share. We are all in this together. And and it's an awakening project. I don't quite know how to put it. And I, uh, I'm a scientist, I'm a skeptic, uh, uh, but there's something here that's, in terms of this awakening, that's astonishing because once, once that comes to be, we recognize that we're all in our own existential dilemma of trying to figure out what <laughs> and uh, what's going, you know, you're questioning that for yourself and then you realize as you look in each other's eyes, they're in the same boat. Uh, we had one of our, yeah, Buddhist meditators say, we're all in the same pickle. And I, 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 I thought that was so, so true. But um, so there, there's something universal about this. We awaken to the fact that we're all in this together. And, and what that does, if held correctly, or held to, in my mind correctly, is it opens us up to deep empathy and compassion. And, and I think, I'm, I'm guessing everyone here gets that at some level. We're drawn to this project. We bring our own interests, resources, curiosity, uh, because we sense that there's something huge going on. So, um, so while I'm hugely grateful to <laughs> for, uh, for this, recognize it, it isn't me, it's us, and it's this community that is emerging out of this incredible... <laughs> This, <laughs> this incredible gift. So, so please let's let's do our best to stay awake, keep awake, 
continue to be aware that we're aware, lean into this and celebrate the preciousness of the big mystery. Thank you so much. Roland, thank you so very much. Thank you so much. I'm speaking on behalf of everyone here, I'm sure. And I'm speaking on behalf of a great many people who are elsewhere in the world and are grateful for all that has come from your work and the people you've surrounded yourself with. And I'm speaking for people who are no longer with us but for generations have hoped for this kind of assisted awakening. I'll name just three of them, Houston Smith, and through him, Aldous Huxley, who all wrote about the kind of waking up that is possible with sacred plants, fungi, and chemicals. So you've been an answer. You might be just the right person at the right time with the right skills and the right connection, but that's a lot. And thank you for bringing our hopes a huge step closer to fruition. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for enjoying the hail and the rain. And uh, please take in the rest of the conference with great gratitude. Good night.